Our next speaker is uh, Terry Taminen, and uh, Terry is now uh, a lecturer, uh, 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 has uh, been writing extensively, and has been doing a lot of consulting on energy and environmental policy, uh, has been advising a number of governors, uh, including the governor, who we'll, who we'll speak to in a second, and a number of premiers on, on those subjects. Uh, in uh, 2003, he uh, became uh, uh, the uh, respond He was leading the Cal EPA, Cal California Environmental Protection Agency, very important and significant uh, post. And then moved in after that to be uh, the chief policy advisor to the governor, and uh, then has moved on now is in, in private practice, but. I was struck. I went to one of the governor's big uh, platform speeches on the environment in San Francisco, room full of people, cameras everywhere, and uh, the first person the governor introduced was uh, Terry. It was quite striking. I think it speaks to the influence that Terry has had on uh, the whole environmental agenda that California has been driving. Uh, Terry, we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, bienvenue à Montréal. Et la parole est à vous. It's yours. Thank you. It's not tethered. I'm going to move it over there. There we go. That's easier. There we go. Clean out the real estate a little bit. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for your warm welcome. Merci beaucoup. Uh, if th for those of you who were expecting Mary Nichols, the chair of our California Air Resources Board, who I think was actually in this slot, uh, she was unavoidably detained in California and found out that I was actually planning to be here for the carbon capture and sequestration meetings, which is a, a topic that, of course, those of us who work in climate change are very interested in these days to see what uh, kind of solutions that can help deliver. So very, very much looking forward to that part of the, of the day, and as well as the rest of the CSIP agenda. And thanks to CSIP and to McGill for hosting this and, and for allowing me to have a few minutes up here this morning. I do also want to just recognize uh, your Canadian representatives in California, my good friend Elaine who just recently left uh, Los Angeles. And for those of you who saw him when he left Canada, and now that he's coming back, you'll notice if you, if you look, a little better muscles, a little better handshakes. He works out with Arnold all the time. <laughs> and that um, hasn't caught up to Mark yet, you'll notice. But, um, uh, but, they, uh, but the governor does send his regards and uh, very much appreciates these kinds of collaborations because they do end up yielding results. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, with our closest neighbors, Canada, we think we can make the, the greatest progress on these issues together and, and lead the world. By the way, just a, another quick side note before I get into actually mostly Mary's remarks, but a, a few of mine. Um, I was so grateful to step off the plane in a place last night where every, every lawn sign was not about McCain or Obama. <laughs> And, and then, you know, I get to my hotel room and the phone rang and it was just the room service guy. It wasn't someone trying to ask my opinion or, or tell me which candidate to vote for. But then I get here this morning at 7.15 and I go to the registration table and there's two big tables uh, that have the, you know, the tethers that you're all wearing uh, for these name tags and you have to choose between blue or red. <laughs> I chose neither for obvious reasons. I mean, you know, I've got my preference, but, you know, I work for Democrats and Republicans. You've got to be careful of these things. <sighs> you can't escape it is the, is the reality. Well, the other thing we cannot escape is our obligation to lead the world. And I think that's certainly what CSIP is doing, and those of you who are here today to discuss the various topics uh, are doing by inventing and investing and figuring out the policy framework for moving forward on the issues we'll be talking about. And as you know, my issue in particular is energy and climate, so that's what I'll address in particular. But the other innovations that we'll be talking about today are equally important, and actually there's a lot of cross-pollination, I think, when science moves forward and when great people get together. It's amazing how that stimulates opportunities in other areas. But it's also somewhat frightening. I mean, even this morning at the early session on carbon capture and sequestration, we heard a lot of daunting statistics about the technology and the money and the, the, the question marks around this particular idea of capturing CO2 uh, in addition to just trying to reduce it as a way of tackling our climate change challenges. And that's, I think, really what we are on the edge of in all of these areas, whether it's stem cell research or the other areas that CSIP will talk about. We're on the leading edge, and it's that uncertainty that sometimes frightens us or sometimes keeps us from being as bold in our thinking and our action as we should be. And so for a moment this morning, I just want to turn back the clock 100 years 
It's not that far back. My grandmother is 102, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you have other relatives who, who have lived back that far. It's just a couple of generations ago, 100 years not that long ago, 1908. So let's say it's 1908 and you are an entrepreneur and you're about to, uh, to build a, a factory. Let's say it's an ice cream factory. Well, in 1908, your ice cream factory, you would have been installing gas lamps to light the factory. You would have been installing ice boxes for the ice cream uh, and, and to keep everything cold. You would have been buying uh, uh, buggies and horses to deliver your products to the store. And if you were really innovative in 1908, as a way of getting orders back and forth from the stores to, to your factory, you might have employed carrier pigeons. And imagine all of the changes that took place. Imagine the young, the young plant manager who comes to you, the entrepreneur, and says, you know, boss, maybe we should think about this new thing called electricity to illuminate the factory. And we could also use this new electricity to power this other new technology called refrigeration. And by the way, shouldn't we be buying these horseless carriages to deliver our goods to the stores? I really think those are going to take over from horses and buggies. And, and you know what? We should probably also get one of these new things called a telephone. I, I, I think everyone's going to have one soon. That might have been the conversation you would have had in 1908. What would you have done? Well, today we're faced with those very same challenges and opportunities. And so when that young plant manager comes to you and says, you know, why don't we think about LED lighting that's far more efficient and therefore has a smaller carbon footprint than the incandescent bulbs and doesn't have mercury like compact fluorescence and what about uh, renewables on our rooftop? In fact, the solar panels on the roof of our, of our uh, uh, warehouse might even generate enough electricity that we could create some hydrogen to power the forklifts in the warehouse. And let's power the delivery vans with battery electrics and natural gas-powered vehicles and hydrogen vehicles and other new technology. And, and let's think about how we can have a, a lower carbon footprint and maybe capture that footprint in terms of, of carbon credits, something that everyone's going to need pretty soon, and we'll be able to sell those to some poor guy in the future who wasn't smart enough to do that today. Well, when that young plant manager comes to you with those ideas, don't look for a carrier pigeon. You'll probably get a text message on your BlackBerry. But my point in highlighting this is that we have faced this challenge of change in the past, and now we can look back and kind of chuckle about what happened in 1908 because we know what happened in the succeeding, 200, succeeding 100 years. This time we don't. But we, the people in this room, are going to invent that future. You are not just here talking about what could be. You are leading the way as to what will be. You are that young plant manager. You are that visionary of the future. And you're helping others to see that, others to understand the science and the opportunity. And in that regard, those of you who are working on climate policy in particular, I thank you because you're putting a framework to something that we should be doing anyway. When people say to me, well, but you know, especially now in tough economic times in the United States to be adding a cost for carbon, we really can't afford it, let's wait a little bit more, or you know, maybe there's still some doubt about the science or you know, about how bad things are gonna be or whatever, let's just take our time on this thing. The reality is these are all things that we should be doing for our economy and our environment anyway. Energy efficiency is something that I think everybody can get behind. You know, the average American uses 12,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per person per year. The average Californian uses only 6,700. And that's not because we don't have our flat panel TVs and our jacuzzis and our air conditioners in the desert. It's because of smart policies uh, that put energy efficiency into place that on appliances, on buildings, that decoupled the profits of our utilities from how much electricity they sell and instead reward them for their investments in energy efficiency. All of these different measures which over a period of time had, have led Californians to be the most energy efficient people in America. And yet we could go much further because the average person in Denmark uh, uses about half the energy we do per person. So there's much more to be wrung out of that sponge with innovation, with investment and with vision.